Um, so uh, excited to be here. Um, and thanks so much to Books or Magic for hosting us. Uh, Books or Magic actually hosted my launch for Bunny. So it's, it's especially exciting um, to be with you guys tonight, hosted by Books or Magic. They're such a great store. And I'm so happy to be in conversation with Dana Spiota. I'm such a fan of her writing. And for those of you who haven't picked up Wayward, which just came out this summer, you definitely should. It's an amazing book. Um, so I'm just gonna start by, um, by reading um, the opening of All's Well. Uh, Serena gave a great uh, introduction to it. It is, it's about a theater teacher who's battling chronic pain and she's mounting this, um, you know, kind of cursed production, student production of All's Well that ends well and her students are totally mutinous against her and they want her to put on Macbeth. So when we first encounter her, she's literally on the floor of her office before rehearsal, just in pain and dreading having to go down there. I'm lying on the floor watching against my will a bad actress in a drug commercial tell me about her fake pain. Just because my pain is invisible, she pleads to the camera, doesn't mean it isn't real. And then she attempts a face of what I presume to be her invisible suffering. Her brow furrows as though she's about to take a difficult shit or else have a furious but forgettable orgasm. Her mouth is a thin grimace. Her dim eyes attempt to accuse something vague in the distance, a god perhaps. Her bloodless complexion is convincing, though they probably achieve this with makeup and lighting. You can do a lot with makeup and lighting, I have learned. Now I watch her rub her shoulder where this invisible pain supposedly lives. Her face says that clearly her rubbing has done nothing. Her pain is still there, of course, deep, deep inside her. And then I am shown how deep, I am shown her supposed insides. A see-through human body appears on my laptop screen showcasing a central nervous system that looks like a network of angry red webs. The webs blink on and off like Christmas lights because the nerves are overactive apparently. This is why she suffers so. Now the camera cuts back to the woman, gray-faced, hunched in the front yard of her suburban home. Her blonde children clamor around her like little jumping demons. They are oblivious to her suffering, to the red webs inside of her. She looks imploringly at the camera, at me really, for this is a targeted ad based on my web searches, based on my key words, the ones I typed into Google in the days when I was still diagnosing myself. She looks withered but desperate, pleading. She wants something from me. She is asking me to believe her about her pain. I don't, of course. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Mona. That's amazing opening. And um, I love this book so much. And congratulations. Um, I think it just came out three days ago. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and already uh, rave reviews everywhere. And, um, and this woman, Miranda, this voice, the story really stays very, very close to her point of view. And She's not exactly reliable. I mean, she's so distorted by her pain and her, but she's very, at the same time, she's very self-aware and she's very smart. Where did this voice come from? And is that where you started with this voice of Miranda, this complicated woman? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, I think, I, I think that part of it is, is just the experience of being in pain, which is a very visceral experience. It kind of goes beyond language and you're just trying to grasp at language in order to kind of communicate it to people. Um, and it's that act of having to um, explain it to people, I think that just makes her also very hyper, hyper aware um, and, and, and also very embarrassed and like there's like a part of her that's looking outside and being very judgmental because she can hear herself you know when she's explaining it to people she can hear herself and see herself um in this position and i think it just makes her yeah it, it makes her continually judge her own experience and actually dismiss and deny her own experience even as it is her very real like experience her reality Yes, she's not, she's not very good at sticking up for herself. I mean, she goes to these physical therapists and she knows that they're going to not help her, but right. she keeps going. She's sort of, in the beginning of the book, she's really quite stuck and hitting the bottom, right? But right. How, so how do you manage this tonal thing that you're doing? And we're going to talk about 
Shakespeare, but let's first start with Miranda and, and the beginning of the book where it is very serious and very deep about the invisibility of pain and the privilege of health and these you know, complex issues. Um, but it is so scathing in its humor and uh, satire, I mean, of, the, of that internet ad, but also of her students, of her physical therapist. I mean, she just brutalizes wellness culture, even as she's compulsive, you know, she cannot walk away from it. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it was, it was very interesting to me because, you know, I'd, I'd grappled personally with, uh, with chronic pain for, for a number of years. So I kind of, I really did want to explore the ways in which pain just informs um, our experience. And then also just, you know, can, can, can really like just narrow your life and all of these really awful ways and just everyday ways, you know, I, I'd, I'd had um, hip surgery and then I'd had uh, after, after a very, very difficult recovery, I ended up injuring my back. Um, and then I had all kinds of neurological symptoms down my legs for, for a very long time. And, and it made just daily tasks so hard. Um, and, and when I would go to these physical therapy appointments, because that was really the only recourse, there was surgery wasn't really possible at that point. I'd already had a surgery that was not very successful. I'd met so many people like me who were in this limbo place, you know, um, where recovery just wasn't something that was certain, you know, and, and there was no clear path to it. And so we were all kind of stuck, just kind of living with this pain every day. And, and you don't know how long you're going to be living with it. So there's so much uncertainty around the experience. And all of that is informing Miranda's voice. So she um, is an actress, or she's an actor, and she this pain of the body, this invisible pain, talk to me how that connects to having to perform. She has to pretend that she's not in pain a lot. And um, she's afraid she's going to lose her job and she's going to lose the confidence of her students. How does that connect to Shakespeare and her and the performance of the play and this particular play, All's Well That Ends Well, that she's perversely obsessed with? Yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> thing because because I came to the play uh, when I was in those straits and uh, and I found Helen from All's Well That Ends Well, I found her to be insufferable. I did not. <laughs> I found her to be so single-minded and so like, I don't know, cunning, really very cunning, you know, cunning. She, she, she performs this kind of powerlessness at the beginning of the play. Um, but I just didn't believe it, um, which was interesting, you know, that I, I wanted to deny her experience of powerlessness in the play. Um, but there's something that she says at the beginning of the play. She's this orphan who, um, who loves this courtier who's kind of above her in station. Um, she loves him so much and she'll pretty much do anything. She turns the whole world of the play upside down just to have him. She heals a king, you know. Um, she says, I do affect a sorrow, but I have it too. And that line, <laughs> that line stayed with me, um, stayed with me for so long after I read the play, I would go back to it because that she was, she was capturing something so true about my own experience of pain that I just think about all of our experiences. That happens to us whenever we share pain with other people. There is an, a an affect to it, right? A performance. Um, right. And, and, and maybe that performance, maybe there's like a disconnect between the performance and the experience, but that's the best we can do. Um, and so that performative element of her sorrow, um, I just thought that was perfect for Miranda because she is, she is a performer by trade. And, and she has to perform her pain to these doctors, to her colleagues, in order to get them to understand it. There's a performative element to communicating pain that then undermines your own trust in yourself when you're communicating it because you've just performed it, you know? And it's so, it feels so real. We are so in her body when she's experiencing pain and you have this wonderful language for describing uh, all the varieties from the, the fat man leaning on a chair against the back of her leg. And she's always, you know, sort of lying in the strange position, uh, unable to move with the pills in her pockets. And so we're really with her when she has a chance to escape it. And I think that's such a, the genius of this book is that we are so implicated that when she does this very, she kind of realizes that this magic is enabling her to give pain to other people we're so irritated by the people that have been mad at her that we are excited that yeah. she's getting her revenge. 
Yeah. And, um, and so we, we become kind of monstrous with her. Yes. And then you keep going. And then <laughs> yeah. she gets, I mean, she does this thing, which I think is so inventive and so original, where she's singing and levitating. Talk to me about what happens to Miranda. And maybe you can even read a little bit of, yeah. of what happens to her. But she, this creepy, eerie singing that she, she can't stop, which is hilarious at the same time. She just starts, she can't speak anymore. She starts to sing everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just one of those things where she's just, when we meet her, she's at, you know, she's, she's in her lowest place. And so, and, and her wish is to be free of this pain, you know? And so I think the, 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 the sudden, like the absence of suffering is just an ecstatic state, but it's disturbing. You know, her, her, her pain is disturbing and her joy is disturbing. Um, but I think there's some truth to that. You know, there is some truth to the fact that, that it's actually hard to handle other people's pain. And it actually can be very hard to handle other people's joy too. It's it's difficult for us. <laughs> so so I I really wanted to go there um, with her like that when she kind of becomes villainous and monstrous is when she's the most joyful and jubilant. You know I just thought that was that was a, a fun contrast. Um, so yeah I'll read a little scene um, of her a little bit later on in the book and she's with her students um, and she's she's getting them to to warm up. Um, and she's, she is in a, she's in a, in a, in a much better place. Um, she's getting them to warm up outside and, and her co-director is Grace. That's, that's another thing that you should know. She has this co-director, Grace, who's very suspicious of Miranda's pain and Miranda's joy. What did I tell you? Doesn't it feel just like spring? I sing my breath, a capering cloud. I look at my circle of children huddled obediently on the green, lightly shivering, not so lightly shivering, pink faces, no scripts because I've forbidden them. And guess what? Now they've memorized the play. Now they know it by heart. They stare up at me, the tails of my black coat blowing behind me, standing straight in my heeled boots, taller than I have ever been, casting my shadow over them. Is it just them or have I grown taller in the past month? Wonderful. Well, I say, let's warm up, shall we? Grace looks at me with panic. Oh no. Not another one of my warm-ups. She thinks my warm-ups of late have been a little too wonderful, I say, clapping my hands. Warm-ups are wonderful, aren't they? They get the blood going, get the air flowing, get the cobwebs swept away. Now let's all get in a circle, that's it. Closer, closer, don't be afraid. I don't bite, do I? And I laugh. I'm always laughing these days. Good. Now let's all bend forward and touch our toes. Very good. You too, Grace. But Grace just stands there next to me, watching me fold forward, watching me reach down, watching me sigh with pleasure as my fingers touch the tips of my boots easily, so easy. Really reach down and touch those tips. Wow, doesn't that feel amazing? So amazing, am I right? <laughs> that stretch, wow, 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 so good. Now let's reach up. Up, up, up and touch the sky, shall we? Touch the sun, that's it. Can you touch the sun? See if you can stretch up to the sky with your arms and touch the actual sun. Oh, fuck yes. Feels fucking wonderful, am I right? Miranda, Grace whispers, how your arms just love it. They wanna stretch up, they want the sun, which is not so weak anymore, is it? Not so pale and glimmering dully behind the clouds, but bright and bold and fierce, isn't it? So bright, it'll burn your eyes out, am I right, Grace? Grace just looks at me. Her arms are still folded in front of her chest. Okay, drop your arms back down, arms back down, I tell them. Now we're gonna shake it out, shake everything, that's it. Hands, arms, legs, head, hips, really shake them, don't be afraid. We all shake together. We shake and we shake and we shake. I shake with them. I'm with them every step of the way these days. I'm shaking and shaking and shaking. My limbs, my head, I really get into it with them. I'm jumping up and down, up and down to show them how to shake, hopping on one leg while shaking the other. And as I'm shaking, I'm laughing again because it's just so, so fun. Isn't this so fun? I ask them as I shake and shake and shake. Yes, professor, they huff. I ask them, is that all they have really, really? Oh, I don't believe it. I tell them to go faster, wilder, really let loose, lose yourself in it. Like you're trying to shake off your actual flesh, arms, legs, head, hips, yes, like you're possessed, full of demons. The only way out is to shake, shake them out. 
shake them free, you're free. Oh, it feels wonderful, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. That is so funny. Um, Let's talk about the acting because I, I studied acting a little bit and I, I see a lot of connections between writing and acting, but what kind of, uh, tell me about if you see connections between writing and acting and also what research did you do to be able to create, because it really seems convincing of this kind of podunk theater program and the students in it and how they interact with one another and even and the money stuff with the uh, you know with the university i mean there's so many layers to this book it's that it, it's so many things that it, it brings into it but i found it so convincing so talk a little bit about your research specifically yeah. with the theater stuff yeah it was interesting you know um first of all i mean i just i love voice for me that's kind of where the story's at so um and i love those kind of voices that almost feel very method like you know um oh my god i can't believe i'm blanking on his name right david mitchell like i david mitchell does these incredible voices um and i love those uh those kind of very visceral moment to moment um experiences with the consciousness so i was very keen to um to, to offer that kind of immersive experience um, with, with this book. Um, and, you know, I listen to Macbeth all the time. On you mean audio. the Scottish play? Aren't you superstitious? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I listen to it all the time. Alan Cumming has this one man, um, Macbeth, that he's uh, narrated as well. And you can listen to it um, on, on audio and I listen to it. He, he, he narrates it so beautifully. He re performs it, I should say, so beautifully. Um, so I would listen to that um, because there's a really interesting energy in the Macbeth soliloquies. They're, they're filled with all of this rationalization, but then there are these moments of just like, desire and and ambition that is a, the, where the language becomes a lot more clipped and saxon as opposed to latin and and i just that was really interesting to me i wanted both of those components the the sort of the, the world of reason the language of reason and then the language of just desire um to be in miranda's voice um and then you know uh i i shadowed um I shadowed a director here in Massachusetts uh, for a while. She was teaching, uh, uh, she was directing a high school um, play and a production of As You Like It. But it, it was good for me because it brought me back um, to, to what that world was like. I was in theater in high school. Um, so I was able to kind of revisit and see those, those you know, those cliques and those really interesting power dynamics between director and, and students um, that, that I wanted to have fun with in this book. Yeah, so that, let's talk about the power dynamics because there is the power of being able to um, pass on the pain and there's the power of also determining who's going to be the star right. and who, you know, so Miranda is, you know, playing with all this power throughout the whole um, novel and, uh, and also, there, but there's an other power dynamics too in that one of the main students, her sort of uh, nemesis there, is a beautiful young woman whose parents give a lot of money to the school and so there's some interesting generational uh interrogations you're doing there's a lot of there, she she definitely um resents the the robust health of her students in the beginning of the book right would you say so um can you give me a little bit of what you were trying to do with all of the generational stuff and the student teacher relationships yeah, it's interesting, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, you have, you have your own, because we both teach, um, you know, um, creative writing, that you know, we both have, have those experiences. Um, I thought as a student, I mean, I didn't think necessarily that teachers were all powerful. Uh, I didn't think that or that they knew everything, even when I was a student. Um, but I wasn't aware as a student of my own power as a young person in a group of young people staring at an adult who is supposed to know everything, you know? Um, and it's only when I got on the other side of the desk and was that adult that I, that I kind of, I understand that that's a, that's a very interesting place to be, you know? There's a number of them and only one of you. <laughs> and, um, and so, so I, you know, for, especially for theater, uh, it just seems like it's ripe with the possibility for mutiny. Um, and, and for Miranda too, you know, it was her trade. It was her dream. It was her, her, her whole life was to be an actor. That was what she was. And then she had to leave all of that behind because she had an accident that, you know, didn't allow her to perform anymore. 
So now she's in the role of, of teacher, right? She's in the role of kind of more of an observer, a director, kind of a shadow figure, you know, a shaping force behind the scenes. And that's a difficult role for her to play. It's difficult for her, I think, to grapple with watching other people do the thing that she loves the most that she would love to do so much. So that's definitely informing her feelings about all of them, but especially her nemesis, because she feels, <laughs> however irrationally, um, that her nemesis is unworthy, um, you know, and, and where that feeling of, of her unworthiness is coming from. Yeah, it's coming from the fact that she has money. It's coming from the fact that she has power, power that Miranda does not have as a teacher, um, power that you could only have as a rich, young student. And there's also the intrigue of the other teacher who's kind of <laughs> looking to get her to, to, to uh, screw okay. up. And then Grace, who is sort of the Grace figure. But we don't want to give spoilers away, but let's talk a little, because you are an amazing teacher as well as an amazing writer. And you teach at Syracuse Horror and you teach fairy tales as well as creative writing workshops. And I, I, how do you, you, the magic in this book really doesn't come in till about almost halfway through the book and then it kind of escalates so you get the escalation of the plot and right. of the character arc and then you also get this kind of escalation of, of magic can you talk about how magic works and i use magic i mean i don't know what word you would use for it in this book but some of it feels you're so in the subjective point of view of miranda that sometimes we don't know how much is coming from inside of her and what is external to it, which i think is quite on purpose and, and kind of amazing but some of it is definitely real as well yes yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, she's right on the border, you know, of a, I guess she's kind of a, like a figure between, like right on the edge of the stage, talking to the audience who is the reader. And that, that kind of space is, is an ambiguous space. And I think it's a space that allowed me to open up the borders of reality, right? Because she is um, directing one play on stage, but she is living another play off stage. Um, against her will, very much against her will, but she is, she's living Macbeth off stage. And Macbeth has supernatural components to it. You know, it's got the witches. <laughs> um, and so, so that allowed me to sort of bring the magic in and to bring it in at a certain point when, when she is shifting. She is shifting from the narrative of all's well that she is trying to control and then becoming the hero of quite another story. Where there, is, where there is a supernatural force. And it's unclear to what degree she has free will in that world. Yeah. Right, right. She, she, uh, but there is a point where she understands what's going on. Oh, yeah. And she kind of lies to herself about oh, yeah. how culpable she is, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. A, it was a very, very fun moment. Again, it's that, it's that Macbeth thing of like, trying to reason yourself out of the feelings or trying to rationalize, but then also being ultimately seduced by your own desire, your own ambition, um, ultimately being seduced by it. So having both of those components in her monologues was really important, having that kind of tension there. Because yeah, she totally feels, she feels very um, culpable. Right. Was, yeah. But she's also feeling really good. <laughs> <laughs> good, and that is making her, yeah, that is making her rationalize quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And p some of what she feels good about isn't just that her body feels better, but also that others are suffering. So she's kind of losing this. You think that she would have this empathy from her own experience and she does, and she does ultimately, but for a while there, she's really enjoying <laughs> pain of others, um, which I thought was fascinating that you're, so, you're you know, you, you go to these very intense, um, extreme places, and it really makes you think about your own relationship to those questions in the less magical world that we all inhabit when we judge others and when we have the schadenfreude and all these other things that we do secretly yeah. in our heads, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, I thought that was so compelling. Um, t talk to me about your process, though, because I read yeah. in an interview that you really listen to music a lot when you're writing. And yeah. music comes up. I mean, there's Judy Garland in this book and, and, and Miranda sings. So talk to me about music and writing, because I'm very curious about that. Yeah, it's a weird thing I've always done where, and I'm, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, too. But it just, it just really, it, it keeps me company um, in, a, in a real way, which is wonderful, because writing can be very lonely. Um, but it's another medium in which to imagine the story 
and it's a medium that sometimes gives the story uh, a sense of, of reality before I've actually conceived of it on the page. So it, it exists in music form to me. If a certain song evokes a kind of atmosphere that I'm trying to go for on the page, then I can inhabit that atmosphere through the song. Um, and then I can think about the book and, and start really believing in it as a world and, and right. actually move the story forward. So with Judy Garland, it was wonderful because, I mean, she's such an interesting, very tragic figure. Um, and yet her songs are so, I mean, there, there's a lot of sorrowful, you know, heartbreaking songs, but there are some songs that are very gleeful too, that feel disturbing to me, maybe because I was working on this book, but I mean, I would always hear the, the kind of the shadows in them. And, and just knowing about her own history too, with, with substance abuse and, and addiction and stuff. I just, um, she, was, she was very important to me, that sort of mix of, of brightness and then this like really, these really, these really disturbing shadow elements. Um, so I would always go back to her, um, to her music. And then Stardust um, by Nat King Cole was a song I would listen to a lot because it casts a spell, feels very theatrical, but it's also about the dangers of nostalgia. Um, and that's something that Miranda's suffering from quite a lot, you know? I mean, she's always turning her head back to this life, to this self that she was before. It's, it literally haunts her. Yeah. And it's what, it's what allows her to be seduced yes. um, by these three men and their promise that she can be well and return to that self and that life. Um, yeah. Yeah, and she's pretty thirsty. <laughs> um, and... <laughs> <laughs> very thirsty yeah yeah uh, the sex writing is is amazing and really funny and also disturbing which is yeah. like that would describe a lot of your you know you could go um we could talk about bunny as well i just yeah. think that yeah and i and and um and i think with judy garland you know she had so much pain that she part of the reason she was addicted is because she had to dance and do her yeah. thing even though she was in pain and yeah. and uh and that happens to a lot of performers yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right, we should, we should probably go to, we have four questions, so let's see what okay. they are. Okay, so Julie says, I love your books. Bunny is one of my favorite, I think Bunny is like, is like such a cult uh, obsessed, <laughs> people are really obsessed with it. I love your books. Bunny is one of my favorite books of all time. I wanted to know, what do you think your other main character's favorite Shakespeare play or character? My other character, does she mean Samantha? What Samantha's favorite play would be? What do you think? Uh, Julie, do you want to tell us which character? I think that's what she means. Yeah. Um, what Samantha's favorite Shakespeare player character would be? Um, I, that's a really good question. I think she'd probably like the energy of, uh, I think she'd like Helen, to be honest with you. I actually think she'd like Helen, because Helen, she's an outsider she's alone she's a, she's an orphan girl in this court um but she's crafty she's enterprising you know um she finds her way and she is filled with desire part of the reason why i loved working with her as a character is because unlike a lot of female um heroines she is very open about her desire to the audience you know she's open about how much she is attracted to bertram it's like an attraction that she has and it's eating her up inside. And I feel like Samantha would, yeah, she would like that. She would like, she would like Helen's polarizing kind of quality. She would, she would get into that, that Helen is both villainous and also heroic. Great. Yeah. And Lauren asks, how do you name your characters? Was Miranda inspired in any way by Miranda in The Tempest? Yeah, she was. She was uh, inspired by Miranda in The Tempest. There, there is something about Miranda's role in the world. I mean, it, the role in the world of the novel, where it feels like you know she is ultimately in a play. She's in like a world of of, of illusions, right? Both on stage and off stage. So it felt right to make her to make her a Miranda in that world. Yeah. Could you talk about any non-written influences? This is from John Lemay. Can you <laughs> talk about? Uh, can you talk about any non-written influences that found their way into the book? either the process of writing it or the finished product, similar to how the movie Heathers found its way into Bunny. And this would be, I guess, except, uh, aside from the ones you already mentioned, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, and, and um, yeah, I wanna, I definitely wanna talk, John and I have actually corresponded about this and, uh, and I, I wanna go on John's podcast and talk about this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, election. Um, oh election yeah, oh yeah. A film that inspired, for those of you who don't know, it's a, 
it's a it's a, like a late 1990s I think or maybe 2000 uh, film um, written by Alexander Payne starring Reese Witherspoon and Matthew Broderick and they have Reese Witherspoon is this student named Tracy Flick who's running for um, student body president and Matthew Broderick is this really bitter history teacher maybe he teaches like government too and he's very he he just can't stand Tracy and he doesn't want her to win and he and he cr creates all these like machinations to like make sure that she doesn't but um, it's it's so good I love it so much it's such a dark like comedy. And I love that biting like dynamic between the two of them. And Tracy Flick to me, Reese Witherspoon's performance of Tracy is very Helen. Like yeah. it's, it's polarizing, you know? Um, so so for sure that one. And then the bad seed um, that- Oh, um, the bad seed, I'd love yeah, that. Yeah, I love, love, love that movie so much. Such a great like portrait of monstrousness, you know? Yes. Kid. So she really inspired Brianna too. I could totally see that, okay. Corn wants to know why the weird gentleman versus the weird sisters. Also, you mentioned Borderlands earlier. To what extent do drugs and alcohol create a Borderlands for Miranda? Yeah. Um, so why the why the men? Um, well, it was the end of 2017 when I had begun to conceive of this um, project, and a lot of men. There was the rise of the Me Too movement, and a lot of men were screaming that it was a witch hunt. You know, and trying to cast themselves as these like, you know, persecuted victims, but using like this this language of like witch hunts. And I just thought that was, you know, kind of awful, but I thought it was interesting. Um, and so so I, I thought, yeah, why not? I really wanted creepy witches. And I thought, well, yeah, why not make it these men who are these witches? Um, so that was that was one reason. Um, and then, you know, the, the other reason too is, and this is just an anecdote, which I think is, is I'll just share it because I think it's, I haven't shared it yet, but um, part of the reason uh, why the fat man looks the way he does is because the fat man is one of the three, three men who are the witches, is because he is, uh, he's inspired in part by um, Steve Bannon, who I thought I saw um, a bar <laughs> in the middle of the day. I, I saw him kind of like passed out on a bar. I thought it was him. Um, it probably wasn't him, but it looked a lot like him. Um, and I thought, oh yeah, he would be a perfect witch in Macbeth. Um, so that, that's, that's another reason why. And then drugs um, and kind of opening up the, the borders of reality. Um, yeah, you know, part of the reason why Miranda can't trust her own experience um, is because she is being medicated by the, the, you know, the medical world that doesn't believe her and just tries to shut her up with pain pills and anti-anxiety pills that, that actually make it harder for her to communicate her experience and harder for her to even, um, you know, be present and, 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 and do things, you know, um, and heal. Uh, so I, I wanted to, uh, I really wanted to explore that, how that kind of creates more disorientation, more destabilization in her, in her role as a, as a teacher, um, and then also just in her life. Yeah. Uh, so Teresa asks, Mona, I love your writing so much and how you write characters who risk being disliked, who live such extremes. I'd love to hear more about this. Like, do your characters freak you out? <laughs> and if so, how do you keep writing them? Oh yeah, so what happens if you get really close to a character like Miranda, who's going through all this? I'm curious about that too. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I didn't expect her to be so monstrous. There are some moments in the book, and that, that's part of why I love Shakespeare so much. And part of the, the reason why I drew from Shakespeare is because Shakespeare challenges, uh, challenges the audience with his characters in a similar way, especially his villains, you know, like Richard III, for example, so charming at the beginning of the play, even though he's awful, he's so charming that you can't help but laugh along with Richard and be seduced. And then he crosses a line and you can't really follow him, but you're implicated because you've, you've been charmed up until this point, you're complicit, that's how it feels. And I was, I was very interested in that, those kinds of monsters that, you know, we can't, we have to like, we have to reckon with their humanity and we've empathized with them and we've been charmed by them. So Miranda sort of did that with me. I, I was very sympathetic, empathetic, um, fully inhabited her experience of pain, wanted, you know, her to get her revenge. Um, and yet, you know, she did cross lines in the book where it was very uncomfortable for me um, to follow her. But 
that's just where the character led me. And it was also very exciting and, and felt right for the kinds of plays that I was dealing with too for Macbeth because Macbeth is very challenging that way. Great, I have a one, um, I'm trying, to, I see that some people are asking questions in the chat. Um, yes. Um, uh, uh, can you please ask Dana, look at my questions, thank you. I'm not seeing these other questions. I, um, I see one from um, Julie, what scene is it, what scene that is still, if someone can put um, that question that Kelly asked, and I can't, I'm not able to scroll into the Q&A or ask it for me. Uh, in the meantime, Julie asks, what scene that is still in the book did you write first and what scene gave shape to All's Well first? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I know this sounds really crazy, but I, I like to start with the beginning. <laughs> I know that it's just, I don't know why. I've been, that's, that's been the case for both Bunny and All's Well, where the first thing I wrote was actually um, the opening. So I wrote that, that party scene in Bunny. That was the first thing I wrote for Bunny, was that party scene. Um, and then it had a different form initially, but it, it was still the party scene. And then, then for this one, it was her on the floor. It's, it's great because she's like, it was great for me to get to know her that way because she is watching somebody else perform pain, you know, in an ad uh, about pain pills. Um, so it just said so much about her. I learned so much about her in that first scene that I was able to kind of to go from there. And, and that's always good when that happens. That did not happen with 13 Ways. I was all over the place with that one. But. Okay, so I did get one of Kelly's uh, questions okay, here. Can the author talk more about three men, the three men and what they represent to Miranda and to the author? And that goes along with Corin's follow-up. Can the author talk more about the three men? Oh, she, thank you, Corn. put that in there. Okay, okay. that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Corn. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love that uh, people are interested in the three men because I was really interested in them. I mean, above, above all, to be honest, I just wanted to write witches that scared me, you know? Um, and so, so that's, that's really what I was doing with those men. Um, I was just exploring what I thought was a frightening, uh, what, what was frightening to me as, as uh, an interpretation of Macbeth's witches. And they, they know her. That's the thing that's frightening. They know her pain. They can see it. They can see it so clearly. They can articulate it in a way that she cannot even to herself. They see what no one else can see, what everybody else is denying and dismissing. And that is what makes them so powerful, that they can see it. And so she is vulnerable to them, right? Because somebody is finally seeing her. You just happen to be demons. <laughs> so, you know, um, but, but yeah, that's, that's their true power is that they can see, they can see into her. Okay, the, uh, one more question is, um, uh, I can absolutely relate to chronic pain and the struggle with no one believing you. Um, where, did the, um, where did the am I right come from? that oh, Miranda says. Am I right, am I right? Yeah, whenever you hear am I right in the book, there's like some diabolical presence going on. I mean, ah. me, it's just like, that's, that's the sign that the devil's in the room and the devil moves, right? <laughs> it's like an energy that moves. So sometimes physical therapists say it, um, you know, usually it's men that say it in the book. They usually are the ones to say, am I right? Um, but Miranda starts to say it, the deeper in she goes, the more monstrous she becomes. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's meant to be a scary refrain. Absolutely. Great. Well, that's a great place to end. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mona. That, thanks for all these great questions. Thank you all so much. And thank you so much, Dana. That was awesome. Yeah. So grateful. It was my pleasure.